Ma sono tan. Tan di gemanti, sem nam to che vuoi andare a sonno, nemic. Nemic tempo di mare, nam to che vuoi, sem me po. Rangare iarvi, tu me la, ci sam giù già un tempo me. Niente di un altro, sem me, te vendi, san rigne. Tome, tu ne di un son, te ci rientri in giama tos. Within the uh, text itself, beginning uh, on the second page, the third outline, the faults of being continually under the influence of discursive thought. There is no end to discur we there, <laughs> there is no end to discursive thoughts. They won't disappear in and of themselves, for they fear for all their multiplicity and number. They bring no real benefits or results. They can't put an end to negative mental states or suffering. Should you wish to be free of suffering, you must get rid of its respective causes. To this end, you must recognize the faults of discursive thought and emotion. Since time immemorial, you have been under the control of these thoughts and, as a result, have not acquired any genuine qualities. Now give up attachment to such thoughts and do all that you can to cultivate stillness of mind. So here then the essential meaning of these uh, very clear sentences is that when we reflect we have continually been under the control of discursive thought and through becoming engaged or entangled therein we haven't really gained any particular kind of or genuine quality or, or benefit as such. We're sort of encouraged to hearing kind of give up the chasing after of said discursive thought. So, some people say, for example, if uh, thoughts were some... Uh, uh, some people say... Uh, within kind of teachings on this subject matter, that if thought were to have a particular shape or a particular form, if it was something tangible, and we were to kind of gather them together, there wouldn't be a place big enough where we could put all of these thoughts. So, thought pollution. In Patu Rinpoche's writings, he's often uh, quoting... Can you hear? Is it clear? Okay, thank you. In Patu Rinpoche's writings, he often mentions how kind of endless chatter is of no real benefit or of no enduring uh, benefit. When we apply that to thought, it's a similar case that we can have all manner of thought, but ultimately there's no real benefit. But seeing the fault of being continually under the influence then of idle chatter or discursive thought then encourages one to give it up and to move away and to practice in uh, lonely places. <laughs> So here when we think of either chatter or thinking about things or getting involved you know, internally, usually then within the two it's more often than not then, it's the negative that we are greatly addicted to, such that we kind of continually reflect upon negative chatter, negative thoughts, etc. But here, the point is 
to overcome being under the influence thereof and to move on therefrom. As such, one shouldn't ch- simply uh, d- dwell on the negative. The fourth outline reads of the qualities that arise from overcoming discursive thought. So this is the benefit then. If you can do this, we read, you will gain many qualities such as concentration and uncontaminated <coughs> clairvoyance. You will gain the power to abide by the natural state and find supreme bliss. As such, when we engage in a particular endeavor, in this instance then, uh, the development of uh, shamatha, but generally speaking, this same principle can be applied to anything that we do. We should try to find a delight in what we are doing. As such, when we reflect upon the, the negative side, remaining under the control of discursive thoughts, as such one wants to come out from under the boot of said discursive thoughts, and then having come out from under their influence, there are all these different qualities that arise from overcoming this thought, this, uh, discursive thought are then taught as such. The kind of, when one reflects upon the quality that one oneself can attain, one, one, oneself, or that you yourself uh, can attain, then... Uh, a delight in the path will occur, and with that, a, re, a, re, a renewing of one's determination so as to actualize the result of one's uh, practice. Delighted, sir. So I think any practice, I think, uh, we, I think many people, they ask question, how can I become more diligent or interest? Um, <coughs> To my monks in, in Nepal, I always give them an example that uh, they love football so much. Soccer? American? Sox? Soccer? So- Soccer. Soccer. <laughs> fo- 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 <laughs> I think football is better. You play with the foot. Okay? <laughs> so, when they like so much, then... Um, Sometimes, when, when you have the World Cup, it's always middle of the night in Nepal. So they, they would wake up in the middle of the night to watch the World Cup. Because then they don't feel the difficult to get up. So excited. So excited that World Cup is coming in one week. And then uh, they can get up at night. You don't need to ring a gong or nothing. <laughs> exactly when to come. And then throughout the game, they're just like, like that. So it's just interest. So I think uh, <coughs> teaching here also trying to encourage us in practicing by showing us the default of not practicing, the benefit of practicing. So I think contemplate and thinking on that, then naturally our sort of interest in practice increase. And when our interest in practice increase, then, then there's no hardship, feeling of hardship for practice. Uh, like Kenzi Rinpoche would sit hours and hours on the throne during the Dupchen. So when we were young, young Tulku, when we were young, we used to say the Dupchen ceremony is a video for Kenzi Rinpoche. <laughs> so we love to watch video. Those days, video is very rare. So I like that. So very, very much interest. Then I think you don't feel a hardship. So when you don't feel a hard hardship, then diligence naturally comes. So otherwise you can't sort of force, force, yourself. force yourself and all this kind of. So 
for football or for, for America, maybe a lot of the time basketball. Don't mind waiting long queues uh, for the ticket and getting in. All these things, people don't mind. Be so patient because the interest is so much. That's, so this I usually talk to my monks in the monastery. <coughs> and sometimes they even sneak out to watch football. <laughs> One time the, the World Cup, um, those days we didn't really ha allow them to watch uh, a movie or TV so much. So one World Cup, all the monks got together and they sent me the youngest monk to ask me permission. <laughs> <coughs> and the little one comes and says, can I watch the football tonight? I said, okay. Then brrr, everybody <laughs> all hiding behind. So as such, um, whatever in endeavor one is engaging in, then one should do so in a kind of delighted, uh, with delight, as if kind of leaving a kind of a confined, uh, confined area. I think Dhamma practice should not be abandoned on oneself. Is the right word? Out of, out of interest, not abundant, that I must do that, otherwise then I'm bad, then guilty feeling, then receive the wrong, then you feel bad. So I think Buddhist practice, Sanjay Shajatava, Denya Devi Lamda Shekpa. The historical, historic Buddha, Shakyamuni, is said to have taught the blissful path to great bliss. So I don't travel much to much to the West, so I don't know the Western Sanghas uh, very much, but little, few people I know, then I sort of joke, but maybe it's, in a way it's true, that Western people too much worry about practice, Asian people not enough worry about practice. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes I think you put so much sort of time thinking, oh, am I doing right? Am I sitting right? Not right? So that so much worry there. Right? So maybe I quite often say that don't worry, just practice. Don't worry too much. <coughs> and some one funny case, uh, we, were, we were teaching Ngondro and uh, in the Ngondro you're doing the postation, uh, Guru Yoga, in Guru Yoga you do postation and oneself visualizes Vajra Yogini. So one student said, when I drew Postation, where should I keep my katamga and the, the skull cup? <laughs> so you have to keep the skull cup and katamga and then do postation. <coughs> so I think a little bit too much over it. <laughs> okay. Sem number to be one, the song, Nyebatang, Namdole, Darby, Yuntin, Shebe, Gone, Nyamlin, La Tundu Tabucha, that there are. The fifth outline then is um, having seen the faults of being uh, under the influence of discursive thoughts and the qualities that arise from overcoming a discursive thought, then there are the reasons to apply great effort to the practice. <laughs> We read then, with such an understanding of the faults and benefits, and having gained a degree of control over the mind, continue to practice with unflagging diligence until you achieve calm abiding. Through familiarity with this method of meditation, the moving energy wind of activity which gives rise to so many thoughts will converge at your heart and enter the center of your body. Wild, hard-headed thoughts will be gradually pacified and your mind will become increasingly workable and positive. <laughs> So as it is said, 
if uh, discursive thought can be transformed into wisdom or under the control of uh, wisdom or seduced, if you will, by uh, wisdom, then it becomes the path to liberation. Whereas if the reverse happens and discursive thought seduces uh, wisdom, then the activities of mind become the cause for further samsara. So there is a, a, a sentence in the, sec, uh, the second paragraph. Through familiarity with this method of meditation, the moving energy wind of activity, which gives rise to so many thoughts, will converge at your heart and enter into the central channel. So here, mention is made then within Vajrayana of two practices, the creation and completion phase yogas. Within the completion phase yoga then, there is mention of the subtle channels within the body and one method then of subduing the mind through then the practice of karma abiding is to gather the winds into the center of the central channel at the heart and there through naturally and the karma abiding of mind arises within one. As such, through one should engage with as much diligence <coughs> as possible to actualize the calmness of mind or the stabilizing of mind, shamatha, if you will. Within the completion phase, uh, yoga with characteristics, as mentioned then, there is a method of bringing the subtle energy of the body within the central channel, the central kind of uh, psychophysical channel that runs from the crown of the head to the navel. And if one brings then these uh, kind of branch winds into the heart and they dissolve therein, then the mind becomes under one's own control. And wherever one focuses it, then it will remain upon whatever object one is uh, focusing it upon. At the moment, rather than being able to direct the mind to an object and having it remain calmly or abide calmly uh, thereupon, we are under the control of disturbing or discursive thoughts which kind of pull us in any direction they see fit. As such, here to reverse that, one method is to bring the kind of moving, uh, moving winds or energies, which are then the mount for the mind, into the central channel and dissolve them, that is to say, bind them there so that one takes back control over mind. <laughs> The sixth outline shows how profound and yet easy to practice this particular method of meditation is. You read, even without other modes of introduction from the guru, these pith instructions of mind resting upon itself offer a simple way to calm the mind that has none of the dangers associated with the forceful manipulation of energy. If you are able simply to place the mind upon itself in this way, workable concentration will be won swiftly and with little difficulty. Here there is no need for meditation upon subtle bindus or drops within the heart, nor upon letters, nor any shape and form for that matter, nor is there a need to manipulate the breath. The most profound method of calm abiding is simply to view and rest in the nature of your own mind and to sustain it continually, mindfully. This is easy to practice and brings fast results. <coughs> Karshore 
Yabu shu dus damga ta. Namju ngaran su ta chik shine singen ti. Ta churu damenda. Chuju damenda la kashe chik ugdong la mi bate ya dobo da. Kashe chik chik sorwa la mi bate ya dobo da. Kashe ya tiyanbe kuja na komiya dobo da. Ta shine ki ta mangbo yorwa sangan su nangba la. Within um, the varieties of meditation, med- meditation training or teaching, with particular reference to calm abiding, there are many methods that can be employed. For example, focusing upon the breath, focusing upon a particular sensation within the body, focusing upon a visualized image, say, of the Buddha, for example. There are many methods, aren't there? <laughs> But this particular method is rather extraordinary, isn't it? Here, one doesn't need to rely upon an external image or an external object. Rather, one just turns mind upon itself and rests within that. Within the Great Perfection teaching, we hear of an introduction to the mind, and this, I think, is a, an equivalent there too. As such, if one focuses upon mind itself and simply, and simply rests, Within that experience, as it said right at the very beginning, through practicing this method within that same experience, the the uh, realization of higher seeing or vipassana will naturally dawn. <coughs> Sean always finds the best best text. So I was asking how did how did he find this? <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> I think it's very, very profound. Thank you for asking this, so I also study a little bit today. <laughs> I received the oral lineage, Hol Mihom Kambum, so I received the oral lineage. So here today, I, I don't know, like I said in the beginning, trying to describe something that undescribable, so it's not so easy. Uh, but anyway, uh, you receive the transmission, at least. <laughs> I don't know whether i able to explain correctly or not, but at least you receive the kind of uh, transmission lineage. And many of you senior masters who receive teaching from the great masters, so I'm a little bit embarrassed to talk in front of you. It's like the you already heard the classical music from Beethoven himself. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm trying to play. It's difficult. <laughs> I say like, uh, when you receive teaching from Kenzer Rinpoche, it's like um, tasting the French cuisine, the best French cuisine. I know how it tastes, but I don't know how to cook. So like that. So anyway, you receive the transmission. So I think we recommend we go a little bit meditation in this second part. The gom jamna songo do kong. That norna same jingo bo shiwe rangin la mutu ne te ne tawang yamba kuna trone rigtong nyuma wasa zoko chimbe tayang and thongwe tsulni is that the nyamsa lantang korta wajere doa. If you look at uh, the last page, a summary of the points how calm abiding naturally gives rise uh, to insight. First, rest quietly and let the mind settle. Then, allow the mind to look into itself. Just as when you stare into space and there is nothing to observe, discursive and negative thoughts will naturally be liberated in and of themselves. Then the secret of mind, dharmata, the union, the view of Madhyamika, the subject of the turning of the second dharma wheel, Emptiness and clarity, the subject of the third turning of the Dharma wheel, the subject of mantra, the Buddha nature, will naturally arise. And through the blessings of the realization of a perfect qualified master, his or her lineage, and your perfect devotion, 
an experience of the empty clarity of the great natural state, the spontaneous self-emergent wisdom, which is the meaning of the luminous great perfection, will arise. As such then, a summary of the points. Generally speaking, uh, for a Buddhist practitioner, when one is engaging in some Buddhist activity, whatever that may be, practice for example, then one should always be, you always hold that particular activity with the three uh, profound uh, the sublime points. Initially then, one's motivation should always be altruistic. One should always give rise to bodhicitta, thinking that I'm going to engage in this practice for the benefit of all sentient beings. And holding that attitude, or from within that attitude, then one engages in whatever activity one is going to do. <laughs> The second of these uh, principles is to view the activity that one is engaged or engage, engaging as without any kind of focal point. What this means is to reflect on, on the mutually dependent or the empty nature of the activity. So when we reflect on the six perfections or the six perfect actions, parameters if you prefer, there within, for example, charity, if one is to engage that action perfectly, one abides then within the, the understanding of the mutual dependence between uh, the giver of said charity, the receiver, and that which is uh, given. Understanding their mutual dependence or not, that they are empty of an autonomous uh, experience or nature, one abides in the perfect action of charity. This particular method then is a, a way of holding the mind within wisdom. As such, the perfection of wisdom is naturally uh, present within this uh, particular <coughs> practice. <laughs> such holding mind in that particular state, then one should be careful that one doesn't fall under the influence of uh, distraction and being kind of seduced by or hoodwinked by uh, discursive thoughts that would ruin one's uh, practice. One remains within wisdom. And for the third of these three kind of sublime uh, attitudes is uh, dedication. One dedicates the merit of one's uh, activity uh, to the welfare and the benefit of all uh, sentient beings. And there through one enhances or deepens one's practice. As such, whatever practice of the greater vehicle, Mahayana, that one is uh, to engage, should always possess these three sublime uh, attitudes. Initially then, one has a fine motivation, and this prevents one from falling into erroneous paths. Secondly, one views the action as inherently empty. As such, one then avoids kind of being kind of discouraged or kind of uh, distracted or taken away from one's particular engaged uh, practice and uh, ultimately then one increases and enhances one's uh, practice through dedicating the merit to the welfare of all. As such, the attitude within which one begins the practice, the attitude within which one engages the practice and finally 
how one dedicates the practice, these three, these sublime qualities, should hold any activity of the uh, greater vehicle. So, now, also, so we've been asked to practice a little bit together. So if you'd like to do that, one so kind of a kind of put put your notebook down. And then uh, initially kind of just allow your mind to naturally settle. And then please uh, direct your mind upon itself and investigate a little. Mind exists and does it have a color, a shape, a beginning, an end? Does it abide somewhere? And if so, does it have a place of abundance that you can find? A tangibility that you can hold? Through your investigation, looking for the color, the shape, the beginning, the end, the place of abidance, etc., of mind, having not found that, and then having the idea that there, there is no kind of a tangible mind, and rest within that certainty. And then, if all of a sudden distraction occurs, if a thought arises within you, then look at the origin. Where did it come from? And then when it kind of vanishes from before you, what was its destination? As such, investigate the place of origin, place of abiding, and then finally the destination of thought.
so that's it in a way in the instruction or guidance manuals of the of the great perfection some advice is given to enhance one's practice that one's eyes shouldn't be closed they should be uh, open and similarly one's mouth uh, should be slightly open with the tongue kind of slightly upward and slightly kind of uh, open. So I've read that in many of these uh, guidance manuals. So when you under, uh, the eyes are open, then you just allow the kind of eyes naturally to drop down. There's no kind of forcing the eyes down, they just naturally drop down. However, if you find uh, it difficult to meditate with your eyes slightly open, maybe you know you're so used to kind of following the kind of colors and shapes that are proffered before our kind of eyes. If that is the case, then at the beginning it's okay to close the eyes, but only for a little while. When you have some stability, then try to open the eyes and meditate with the eyes open again. Question answer? Compiled them, and Rinpoche asked for uh, asked that I would read them the questions. So I will do that. Can you hear me? Okay. Rinpoche, what is the one main difference between shamatha? what we are learning today and the mind training teachings that you just taught in New York City. Mind training? Lo Jong. Did I? Oh. I think uh, this one is very unique kind of um, what we call the shamatha right shinne gome tabshi pe chebar chinjire do was pe sabuji jidang yi shi da shinne la namju wanzu ji chi yi shiro lu pa ji mi kwa chen gom ja gyo de kan nang du ko ri hong de gap su da ji pa ji zo rim gi da wa da wa ji do s i think this particular instruction on shamatha by jango mi bar is something which is uh, quite profound in that it focuses upon shamatha, but really within the body of the text we find that it's written from the perspective of the completion phase of practices. So it's really quite uh, unique in that way. And uh, the poem that I taught in uh, New York City on uh, Thursday Night. That was a general kind of teaching on the mind or mind teaching, semtri. But both of these are actually semtri, they cover the same uh, subject matter. So within one's kind of life practice, it is essential. Uh, to receive and to put into practice then these 
methods for you know, training the mind or lojong practices? I think lojong uh, mm-hmm. tea This time no, I didn't give lojong tea. Um, yes, so both teaching I think is mind draw, something. So I, I didn't give any instructions on uh, what we traditionally call kind of mind training or the Kadampa style of mind training, but these mind instructions with regard to the poem of Kepji Dingo Kinsa Rinpoche and also uh, Mipa Rinpoche's profound instructions, they are both methods, f- methods for subjugating or subduing uh, the mind through focusing on mind itself or semti. Ripeche, in the text there's the phrase, <coughs> remain there with a gentle tranquility. Maybe somebody can help find that uh, page number. Mm-hmm. Okay. You found. Mm-hmm. Fourth paragraph of the actual instructions, which third page. Okay. Oh, okay. okay. Um, when thoughts run wild, look toward their source and remain there with a gentle tranquility. Page one. Third okay. paragraph on the actual. Um, in that phrase, remain there with a gentle tranquility. Is this tranquility discovered or is it spontaneously arising? Um, is it discovered? Is it spontaneously arising? Or does it need to be generated or cultivated? Mm. <coughs> when thoughts run wild, look towards their source and remain there with the drink, uh, remain there with the gentle uh, tranquility. So here, when thoughts arise in the mind, one looks toward any thought. Even, do I need to make this tranquility is a thought, isn't it? <laughs> One looks to, to kind of towards the source of that thought and simply remains there. The important point is not to, to make anything or to try to do anything or to contrive anything. One simply remains within looking at the source of the thoughts and it remains there and through that, then the kind of tranquility and the various qualities aforementioned will naturally uh, arise. So the most important thing is not to try to contrive the experience, to make up the experience. One simply lets go and remains within the letting go. In the um, Kepji Dingo Kinzer Rinpoche's commentary on the uh, sadhana of Vimalamitra, there within we find a method where the actual letting go is like cutting a bundle of hay. All the hay just falls down to one side and just goes poof. <laughs> And you just remain. So this is a, a mode, as we, we read here again, kind of relax, of relaxing into or just letting go. And then once you've let go, what remains is, is that's, that's what you do. You just stay there. So here then, what to do, for example, 
if you think, well, this tranquility doesn't last very long, am I doing it right? Is something going wrong? There's a whole list of things to do when you, if you look afterwards. If you, if you experience a blankness, relax into its natural calmness. If there's an experience of intense clarity, relax into its natural calmness. If there is an experience of mind going wild and giving rise to many thoughts, relax into its natural calmness. And through familiarity, the tranquility, the experience of tranquility will increase. Yes. Thank you, Rinpoche. Rinpoche, I've heard that Vipassana Loktong is a specific practice or technique. How is it that Vipassana gradually dawns, arises from shamatha? Did you say Lokjong? Lokjong is not Vipassana. Loktong. In the first, in the very first line of the text that yeah, yeah. says if you focus mind, mm-hmm. you'll come to achieve shine and gradually lock tong yes. into the nature of things will dawn. I don't know. No experience. Yes. <laughs> so I can't talk from experience, but possibly using this partic- peculiar method, if one is able to remain within uh, calm abiding, then naturally insight into the nature of the things, higher seeing, will naturally arise from within that uh, experience. <laughs> So when we talk about the fundamental nature of things, or sometimes it's translated as the way of abiding of things, the natural state, and this is what is, the insight therein is what is meant by insight or, or vipassana. But I think also, I was just mentioned to Rinpoche, in English, when we say khlaton, there can be a particular emphasis on analytical meditation, whether one analyzes into the natural state or through one's uh, teacher's quintessential instructions, it naturally arises, the experience is the same. Thank you, Rinpoche. Rinpoche, I've been taught, <coughs> excuse me, I've been taught the, sh- the shamatha technique of paying attention to the breath. Here it talks about drawing awareness into the center of the heart. How do these two techniques relate to each other? It's a different, I think, different method. Relates, no? Method mandavari. Method mandavari. Javati nigati shinei javati shinei. These are simply different ways to get to the same result. They're different methods to acquire or to achieve calm abiding. Mm-hmm. <laughs> The majority of uh, people in this room, we are familiar with the uh, practices of um, Mahamudra or Mahasandhi, Dzogchen. So this particular way of cultivating calm abiding is particularly relevant. However, if you are not familiar with this particular style of meditation, it doesn't matter if, uh, for example, meditating on the inhalation and the exhalation of the breath is, uh, brings you a kind of a greater clarity, then by all means one should use that a particular uh, method. These are just methods, differing methods, which go to the same uh, result. <laughs> Then 
there is a, in the writings of uh, Jangomi Panambache, there is a practice called the treasury of blessing. And within that particular method, one is encouraged to focus one's attention upon a visualized image of the Buddha. And Bipanam Rinpoche wrote one volume commentary on how to achieve calm abiding based upon that particular model or that particular way. Here, however, this is a kind of quintessential pit instruction <coughs> within which one is simply turning the mind on itself to acquire a calm abiding. Different method, same result. Bipanam Rinpoche's one commentary, Kenzo Rinpoche's quite big one on that and Lama Shon is translating, so yeah. soon will be available. <laughs> oh, it's already translated. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Mipa Rinpoche wrote one really large volume, and Kepji Dingo Kinzi Rinpoche wrote a kind of condensed version of that, which is still about 50 pages long. So that is available on Lots Our House site. So if you'd like, you can find many things there. Free. Free, yes. yes. No, <laughs> no cost. <laughs> Lotsawa, L-O-T-S-A-W-A dot org. Yeah. Uh, house. Lotsawa uh, House. Lotsawa House. I can, I'll, uh, if, I'm, if I may, excuse me. L-O-T-S-A-W-A-H-O-U-S-C. L-O-T-S-A-W-A, Lotsawa House. Straightforward. H-O-U-S-E. Lotsourhouse.com. Uh, dot org, I'm, I apologize. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rimshe, what color is your mind? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I'm, ju- I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Blue. <laughs> Sky. Rimshe, how can mind, how can the mind observe itself? Are there two minds? You yeah. Of course, that idea is there when we think about an observer and that which is observed. It can be or it can appear that there are two things at play. And many people kind of have this uh, question. I think an uh, example of the two wood, you know, two wood, two stick, two stick, and then the ultimately it burns everything. So, observer and observe. Kasa, taja taja nika thatu thni ngovchi ngal paiyen roe thati nego. This is a, on a on a relative level, an intellectual level, if you like, when one kind of brings the mind within, when one focuses mind upon its uh, upon itself, then. Is as in the example of the two pieces of wood or the two sticks that you rub together. Through rubbing them together, through mind investigating mind, eventually then the wisdom uh, arises which consumes both of the uh, of the sticks. So we have to use kind of mind, and then when we use mind, then we look at the essence of the of the mind. If uh, one doesn't kind of bring mind to mind, so to speak, then there's no essence uh, to to look with to look at or to dwell within. How long does it take? No, I'm kidding. Again, sorry. <laughs> I made that up. Uh, Rinpoche. Hey, well, that's a good one, I think. <laughs> <laughs> it's. Uh, I think it's a very good one. Really, like there is depends on depends on the the maturity. Huh? Maturity. maturity depends on maturity. Um, some just uh, like that right away. Some might take a little bit longer, but I think constant, constant effort, again and again, again and again. So for some people, there are a lot of stories by just uh, like a small gesture or like, I think I told the story the other day, just a small gesture from the spiritual master or something like that can be, uh, can click, I think. 
think so, yeah. Then sometime might take a little bit long time. So I think uh, for the Vajrayana practitioner, therefore we encourage to do the Guru Yoga practice. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, Rav uh, To enhance the process, Guru Yoga is encouraged? Yes, for the Vajrayana practitioner, if you are in the Vajrayana practice, I think in order to really like actualize the nature of mind, the best way is to focus more on Guru Yoga practice. Yeah. Instead of the shamatha practice or together with in uh, no, the question you are asking is how, how long does it take? How long, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Rupsh. <laughs> Here there's no Guru Yoga, nothing. There's no Guru Yoga, this one. Yeah. But you don't what real did it. Hmm. Generally for the introduction so as to kind of enhance one's practice leading to realization within the Vajrayana tradition, the practice of merging with the wisdom mind of the spiritual master or guru, Guru Yoga, is greatly uh, encouraged. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Rinpoche, how does this differ from shamatha instructions in the uh, sutra tradition? This seems to be, uh, this particular teaching, this text, seems to be uh, very much like a Dzogchen or Mahamudra yes. teaching. Mm -hmm. And um, how, how does it differ from uh, sort of the common shamatha in instructions? Sutra mostly, I think, uh, using the Buddha object. In, in Buddhist tradition, mostly Buddha object or sensation. Uh, focusing on sensation. But this one, like you said, I think it's more connected with the Dopachimbo, um, yes. So I think different methods, different methods. Yeah. I think very much relevant to the modern world, busy world. Mm. This one. Thank, thank you, Rimshe. That concludes the prepared questions. Mm -hmm. we, we did arrange for a special um, presentation. Would you like to okay. do that now? Mm -hmm. or? Okay, so just uh, like uh, to conclude. beginning, I said, very, very nice uh, uh, text. Thank you for Sean finding. Oh, Derry found. Okay, thank you. You found this. Oh, thank you. So you are the Dharma Interpol. <laughs> mm, very good. So, yeah. so at least I don't think I did a good job trying to explain something which is unexplainable. Uh, but at least you receive the kind of lineage or, or transmission. And uh, Lama Shon uh, very kindly have translated. Uh, so I think it will be very helpful and uh, very good uh, to put in practice. Like I was saying, I was saying before, that I think we live in a very busy world, very kind of uh, lots of things happening, stir our, stir, stir our mind, stirs our mind. So I think very much necessary to practice. And this I think is... Normally, when you say, oh, shamatha or, or vipassana, sort of can't be considered as begin, beginning before Mandro and all this. But this, I think, is like the preliminary, main practice, and the result, everything kind of combined looks like that. So that's wonderful to share with you some of the things that I heard from Kenzir Mbuche, not out of experience, but just uh, the words that I, I heard. So very happy to share with you today. So thank you. So that's the conclusion. And we make a dedication prayer or after the after okay, okay. okay. We have a famous uh, uh rock star with us today. I don't know if you are aware of that. 
And upon uh, Rinpoche's suggestion, we requested him to share uh, some of his genius with us. So please uh, welcome Krishna Das. Good. <clears throat> as good as I'm going to be. <clears throat> so we'll start out with some ohms together. Just I want to sing a short prayer that Bernie Glassman gave to me. Calling out to hungry hearts Everywhere through endless time You who wander, you who thirst I offer you this body mind calling up to hungry spirits everywhere through endless time calling up to hungry hearts all the lost and the left behind gather round and share this meal your joy and your sorrow I make it mine. Calling up to hungry hearts everywhere through endless time. You who wander, you who thirst, I offer you this body mine. Calling up to hungry spirits Everywhere through endless time Calling up to hungry hearts All the lost and the left behind Gather round and share this meal Your joy and your sorrow sing with me, that would be nice. Om Tare Tu Tare Tare Swaha Om Tare Tu Oh 
Uh-huh. 
Uh, workings underfoot that you may come back so please include us in that list of places you've come to a small token of our gratitude and uh, so please join me in uh, the lineage the supplication rather to uh, Lynch's long life that's at the end of your text
satisfied your body indestructible permanent and firmly abiding by the speech unceasing melody of Brahma suffering the stainless heart and mind of empty bliss <coughs> grant you virtuous excellent universally learned one sunlight of the teaching of Samantabhadra and Padmasambhava's tradition of Mahasandhi supreme and unequal Dharma lion of its study and practice may your three secrets remain firm as a Vajra as you remain the pinnacle of the living banner of faith and merit of the saffron clad followers in Tantra teachings May the three spheres of your activity increase and flourish, and may your fame spread throughout the entire world.